Welcome to the UGC NLUD e Partiala project on competition law. And the paper we are going to discuss is dominant position and its abuse, which specifically talks about identification of abuse, use of abusive, uh, abusive use of dominant position. And we are trying to see that how a dominant enterprises abuses the uh, its position in the relevant market. The learning outcome of this particular module is that uh, the learners would be able to enumerate the conduct which would be termed as abusive under the competition act and in fact they would be able to understand and examine that which are the points which needs to be considered we will see some of the cases also in this and they would be able to explain the concept of unfair and discriminatory conduct in purchase and sale of goods and services which is one of the factors second they would be able to uh, explain the concept of predatory pricing and explain the concept of leveraging which is uh, and one of the components of the abusive conduct which is enumerated in section 4 of the act. Here we need to mention one thing that the codes which are used from the CCI orders may not be final because they may be at the appellate stage and the uh, learners are requested to update themselves with the latest order which is available in the competition appellate tribunal or maybe thereafter if it is went to Supreme Court then the decision of the Supreme Court. With this particular disclaimer, we begin with the module and if you see, you see uh, the section 4 of the act tells you about the definition of dominance and then we see that how this particular dominance will be utilized or has been utilized on the basis of a complaint which has been received under section 19 of the act by the commission or or suomoto action taken by the commission or maybe a reference received by a statutory authority by the commission it can take an action and while taking an action it has to find out that which are the abuses the, the dominant position or the dominant enterprise has entered into. Now the dominant enterprise may go into two kinds of abuses and these are categorized around the world the categorization is into two, two kinds one is called exploitative abuse and the other one is called exclusionary abuse. The exclusionary abuse is basically the exclusion of the competition from the market. So we have seen the definition of the dominant enterprise. It says that it acts independent of the competitive forces or it tries to affect its competitors, consumers or market in its favor. While doing so, if it is excluding the and competitors from the market or it is excluding the entry from the market and here we need to differentiate again that there are there may be legitimate practices of businesses and there may be illegitimate practices or unfair practices. So here we are not concerned with that thin line difference of legitimate practice, right? We are concerned with the practice which is illegitimate or unfair to the competition in doing this particular aspect or abusing or excluding the uh, competitors from the market. Here I will give you one example of upstream and downstream market which happens. For example, there is a case of a margin squeeze. Now here what happens is if we are talking about a vertical chain and in vertical chain suppose the raw material supplier is the dominant enterprise and the uh, raw material which is used for producing the product in future or by the other players in the market and there is a discrimination between this raw material producer in providing the raw material at a price higher to the other players than its own unit then definitely the outcome product will be costlier for the other producers than the dominant enterprise and this will definitely affect the competition in the market and this is not right this is this may be exclusionary so this is how we go ahead we will see more elaborate examples when we see the provisions of the act when you talk about exploitative abuses this is basically a direct harm to the consumers and this can be by way of a excessive pricing so suppose there is a dominant player in the market he knows that there is no market entry there will be no players which will be coming in the market and this fact he exploits and thereby raises the price of the products then definitely this is an exploitative abuse. Here we need to understand that around the world exploitative abuses may not be of that of a big concern than exclusionary abuses because exclusionary abuses have a long term impact in the sense that competitors are excluded from the market and the rivals get or you can say the dominant enterprise get a chance to raise the prices or abuse its position in the market because of absence of competitors in the market. So it is a more of a concern exclusionary abuses. In competition act 
there is no difference between the exclusionary and exploitative abuses. However, if you see the Raghavan Committee report, it has made a recommendation or you can say it discussed this particular aspect of exploitative and uh, you know exclusionary abuses and difference of it. But this thing has not been included in that. Now the concept of abuse is basically an objective concept. It is a concept which has to be seen from the facts and circumstances of the case and one has to find out you know to see that what has happened, what are the factors, how it has been abused and all these factors needs to be considered and which was laid down in the famous case of ECJ in Hoffman La Roche and the commission examined that it is an objective concept. In the cases which the commission has examined, the Competition Commission of India, uh, we can see it, it is an objective concept in the sense that all factors are being examined, all aspects are being examined, there are several things which are considered while determining that what kind of a abuse it is and how exclusionary it was. Section 4 of the act provides for 5 categories of abuses which may be exploitative or exclusionary depending on the circumstances and which we may, may, may categorize but the act expressly does not make a distinction. The first category is the abuse which relates to condition of purchase or sale and price in purchase of sale of goods. So it is basically bifurcated into two parts clause 1, sub clause 1 and sub clause 2. So we say this 4 to A1 and 4 to A2. So 4 to A, 4 to talks about, it says a dominant enterprise or group would be held to abuse its dominant position if it directly or indirectly imposes unfair or discriminatory conditions in purchase of sale of goods or service or price in purchase of sale including predatory pricing and this is predatory pricing is expressly mentioned here and it has also been defined in the explanation, we will see that of goods or services. So the first part talks about the unfair imposition of pricing or discriminatory imposition of pricing, so it relates to price. Now the second, uh, the first, the second part talks about price, second part, part talks about the condition in purchase. Now let us see the first one that is unfair and discriminatory conditions. Now unfair and discriminatory has not been defined under the act, however the unfair and discriminatory has to be interpreted as I said it is an objective concept, it has to be seen that how unfair it is in relation to the allegation at the same time in relation to the conduct which has happened in this particular matter. However, if you see we have one has to relate this particular term of unfair trade practice and this is, has been defined in the Consumer Protection Act which essentially enlists a host of practices which is being adopted for the purpose of prolonged promoting sale, use of supply of goods or provision of any services and there are several interpretations of Supreme Court and various courts which can be utilized in finding out that what is unfair and discriminatory. So this is how the commission examines it. Let us see there are four cases which I propose to take in this particular aspect. One is a famous case of DLF which talked about unfair and discriminatory conditions of purchase and sale. This was a case in which the apartment buyer owners were subject to one sided apartment buyers agreement which had an unfair and discriminatory conditions, a lot of unfair and discriminatory conditions. Uh, let us enumerate some few, few of them. For example, there was an unilateral change in the conditions without concurring with the apartment owners who have bought the flat, uh, bought the uh, flats. For example, increasing the number of floors or the height of the building, or uh, so that the common area gets distributed between the more number of people. So this was an unfair and discriminatory condition. There was a condition which was uh, in relation to the interest payment. For example, if the uh, the purchases defaulted, there was an interest rate as high as 18%. And if the DLF, uh, if DLF defaulted, there was an interest rate only of 5%. There were different other kinds of uh, discriminatory conditions also which were examined by the commission and it was found that this is, these are all abusive conditions. And that is how it was held to be in violation of section 4 to A of the act and 630 crores was the fine which was imposed on DLF which was, which has been subsequently upheld by the competition appellate tribunal and at present you must be knowing that it is uh, under the appeal before the Supreme Court of India on merits. So let us see what happens in this particular case subsequently but the point which I am trying to make out is that unfair and discriminatory conditions can be interpreted in an objective way. So it is, uh, it has to be seen from the facts to facts, right. 
And in this case, I would like to also point out the minority decision also. It is very important from a discussion point of view. If we see the member R. Prasad gave a minority opinion in this, relying upon the Kodak decision. And if you see that particular Kodak decision, it talks about the aftermarket. So here, the member R uh, differentiated two markets. One market is the sale of apartment and buyers. And second was the post sale, that was a different market. So it says that, that the, there was an abuse by DLF in the post sale market. That is once a customer is logged in with that particular apartment or with that particular builder, then definitely he has to comply with all kinds of conditions and objectives in the next thing. So this was a very important thing to be considered, but it is a minority opinion, so not much of a relevance, but from an academic point of view, from a discussion point of view, this is very interesting and one has to relate this. In this particular case, there is one more development which is of importance is that when the matter went to appeal before competition appellate tribunal, the competition appellate tribunal remanded the matter back to the commission to see that how to modify the agreements. It is interesting that in one of the relief which the commission gave or the uh, order which the commission gave, it said that the DLF was uh, directed to uh, amend the agreements in consonance with the competitive principles. So the compact directed that what should be the ideal agreement. And in fact, the commission modified those agreements and gave a sample modification agreement to that. However, at a later point of the time, that was turned down by the compact, which is again subject to appeal before Supreme Court. So let us see what happens in this. So a lot of things happening in, on the unfair and discriminatory condition area. Let us take another example of uh, Pragati Maidan case. This was a case which was brought, up, brought in by the uh, you know, exhibitors and we all know Pragati Maidan is an area wherein a uh, lot of exhibitions keeps on happening. And the allegation was that ITPO which manages this, that is your International uh, Indian Trade Promotion Organization which uh, organizes this or manages this particular Maidan has been held to be unfair and discriminatory towards the other uh, exhibition, ex exhibitioners than its own exhibitioners as far as the uh, booking dates are concerned. For example, there was only 15 day period cancellation period which was available to the other people and 45 day period uh, available to the uh, its own people. And this were, these conditions among others were considered to be abusive. And in this particular case, the commission again imposed a penalty and around 67 crores uh, was uh, imposed as a penalty in this particular case. Coal India case is a case yeah, and it is a very famous case uh, uh, for two reasons. One, that it involved a very important sector that is coal. And second, that in this case, there was a penalty against a public sector undertaking. Giving, making a point or proving a point that there is no distinction between a private enterprise and a public enterprise as far as competition law in India, India is concerned. And in this case, Coal India was alleged to have abused its dominant position in providing the fuel supply agreement with the uh, electricity manufacturers or electricity plants in Maharashtra and Gujarat. So we got around, there were around four or five cases which were uh, presented and in this particular case it was from Maharashtra State Electricity Generation Company, Mahajenko and there was a case from Gujarat State Electricity Generation Company and it were against the subsidiaries of Coal India Limited. And Coal India Limited was one of the parties. And the allegation was that they were not having a uh, you know, fair fuel supply agreement irrespective of the mandate of the government. Or, and in this case, the allegation of unfair and discriminatory conditions were that they were having unfair and discriminatory conditions in relation to the sampling because they were not providing adequate samples. They were not providing the coal which was paid for. They were giving something of a uh, low quality coal. There were a lot of boulders and stones coming up in that particular coal and there was no remedy left because the coal India was in a dominant position. The power purchasers didn't had any other option to move to some other producer. Though there was an option for import of coal, but that was not a substitute for the coal which was provided by the Coal India. So this is also one important point in this particular case which needs to be considered in relation to the module 17. So you can refer to that there. So in this case, there was a penalty which was imposed by the commission and commission imposed, it was one of the heaviest penalties, I think 1,700 crores in this particular matter on Coal India Limited and its subsidiaries. So this matter is also in appeal, but 
the point which came up here is one very important point was in relation to advocacy also. So if you see in these particular cases, in DLF also, as well as in this Coal India, the commission said or made an observation that Coal India it was not producing its op optimum. So it would have gone uh, for more production. So why it was happening? Because of its dominance. So what was the observation of the commission that if there would have been more players, definitely there would have been more competition. And that is how it was taken into. In DLF matter, the commission said that there was no real estate regulator and there was a need for having a real estate regulator and that is why we need to consider this particular aspect of uh, recommending for a re real estate regulator or and in this particular case in fact the uh, order was sent to the secretary and as well as the uh, Haryana Urban Development Authority for compliance and uh, the, it was marked to government also to look into this particular aspect that whether we can have a real estate regulator or not. In Adani gas case and it is another case which talks about the gas supply agreement and in this particular case also it was found that there was an abuse by the gas uh, manufacturing companies and uh, that is your uh, Adani gas which was supplying gas in the Faridabad area and Faridabad industrial users were using that particular gas and this gas supply agreement had an abusive clauses. So it was kind of a similar thing which was which we saw in the coal India case. So these are the different cases in which has been held by the commission as far as your abuse relating to condition of purchase and sale of goods is concerned. Let us come down to the second sub clause of this clause and that talks about unfair and discriminatory pricing. Now differentiating the competitive and anti-competitive practices as far as pricing is concerned becomes very important in the sense that discriminatory pricing, pricing is an aspect of business and business should be free to price its product as it likes. So one should not say that yes uh, this is uh, pricing is high or low. That is why we see that exploitative pricing is not considered as bad. So what is considered bad is the unfair and discriminatory pricing if it affects competition in the market. So analysis is always in relation to the unfair pricing or discriminatory pricing is in relation to costs. So what has to be determined is the cost of the uh, thing and that is why it becomes too technical and it requires a lot of analysis to find out that what pricing is an unfair and discriminatory pricing. One of the seminal cases which has been decided by the commission in this is MCX and NSE case and here the commission looked into the unfair pricing kind of a thing and it said that the concept of unfair pricing was basically uh, you know zero pricing can also be said it is, you know, zero pricing is unfair pricing zero pricing is a subset of unfair pricing that is what the commission said though it could not or it did not go into the detail of predatory pricing in this particular case and this was a case in which national stock exchange uh, we all know is a big uh, big stock exchange and it is one of the biggest stock exchange in India and definitely a dominant player and it was held that it was having actions or you can say work in all area for example your equity, debts and all kinds of stock exchange services. But currency derivatives MCX was the uh, stock exchange which was only into the currency derivatives and NSE entered into the uh, currency derivatives market. What happened in this particular case is that NSE in the initial years started with uh, zero pricing. Zero pricing in the sense it would not charge the currency derivative players for its platform or all kinds of services. So this was alleged as an abuse of dominant position, in fact predatory pricing by MCX before the commission. Commission noticed and find out that there is a concept we should understand, there is a concept of penetrative pricing. So this penetrative pricing or you know uh, advertising in the initial days giving free products to the market or the consumers for the initial period is recognized and it may be right but how long? So in this particular case the commission noted that this penetrative pricing cannot be or promotional pricing cannot be for a longer period and that is how it said that the unfair price or zero pricing by an NSE in currency derivative market was annihilating or destructive pricing and it was beyond the parameters of promotional 
or penetrative pricing. So this is what is an important uh, case which is dealing with that. Let us see the concept of predatory pricing itself because it has been defined specifically under the law. And explanation B to section 4 defines predatory pricing and it says the sale of goods or provision of services at a price which is below the cost as may be determined by regulations of production of goods or production provision of services with a view to reduce competition or eliminate the competitors. So here the intention is important and here the cost factor is also important. So these are the two aspects which needs to be considered when you determine the predatory pricing. Now determining the cost factor, there is a regulation which has been framed by the commission for the purpose to find out that what is the appropriate cost standard which needs to be considered and that is the Competition Commission of India Determination of Cost of Production Regulations 2009. Now this regulation, briefly I would say that it says unless justified, that is section 3 probably, unless justified selling a product by a dominant enterprise below the cost of production to be taken as average variable cost generally would be predatory pricing. So if the cost of production that is your average variable cost is x and you are selling at a price minus x then definitely it is a predatory pricing and it should be, it is not right and it is liable to be uh, charged under section 4 to A2. Now there is a concept of excessive pricing. But excessive pricing is an exploitative pricing as I said earlier and by and large this price setting has not to be considered uh, by the competition regulator. In fact, price setting is a mechanism which has to be considered by the sectoral regulator generally. For example, we have got TRI, Telecom Regulatory Authority of India and we see that these pricing are being determined by TRI in relation to telecom sector. We have seen the 2G spectrum and all these pricing aspects. Similarly, if we see the insurance market, the pricing and all those things, though it is an open market, but still certain guidelines are being given by IRDA. Similarly, we have got pricing thing in PNGRB market. If you see the PNGRB Act provides for the PNGRB authority or PNGRB board, which deals with the pricing in different petroleum products. So this is how the pricing is being specifically reserved for the sectoral regulators, but competition regulators does not chip in specifically for the pricing aspect. But where does the pricing comes up is if it becomes unfair and unfairness there is a predatory pricing which we have already seen. But whether excessive pricing will be unfair pricing is a grey area which has not been touched upon uh, as of now by the commission. And I, uh, as we said the exploitative pricing or excessive pricing by a competition regulator is, a, is not desirable also. So in exceptional circumstances yes it may be taken. Let us take an example of South Africa where the things are different. It is here the excessive pricing has been expressly defined under the law and it says a price for a goods or service which bears no reasonable relation to the economic value of that good or service and which is higher than the economic value referred to above. So basically it is talking about the economic value of the concept. Now what is the economic value is again a interesting question because how do you find out that what is the economic value? It depends on the analysis and determination. So in fact they have taken, South African law has taken the definition from United Brands case where they talked about this economic value. But determination of this economic value it itself is a, it's itself is a big challenge. When we talk about this unfair pricing, this unfair pricing recently the commission is seized with two matters, two, three matters in relation to unfair pricing and that was in relation to FRAN terms that is fair, reasonable and non-discriminatory access to the standard essential patent. So it was in relation to the intellectual property and this was a case filed one by Micromax, the another by Intex and these are the two cases in which the commission took up with uh, about the you know against the Micromax the case was filed and these are the cases in which it was alleged that the Micromax was not granting the access on fair and reasonable terms. And price is one of the factors in this because they were charging discriminatory pricing for different players in the market though according to the FRAN terms it would have been given at equal terms or equal access to different players. So this is an area, a new area which is emerging and which needs to be examined further or which needs to a further examination or a detailed examination which is under uh, consideration by the commission. 
So these are the, this, this can be food for thought to go ahead for further discussion and further understanding. So let us see what happens in these cases. Going ahead, we come down to another kind of uh, abuse which is called royalty rebates and margin squeeze. Now this royalty rebates and margin squeeze is a kind of a unfair and discriminatory practice. And in this unfair and discriminatory practice what happens is that you dif differentiate. I have given already a, one example before that you differentiate between the two, uh, your own supplier and the other suppliers. So in a downstream market and upstream market this happens. And in Intel case, it was seen that uh, EC imposed a fine on Intel for abuse of dominant position in the market of computer processing units by offering rebates to the computer manufacturers conditional upon them purchasing all or great majority of CPUs from it. So this was a kind of a case in which, you know, the uh, uh, maximum number of, so uh, the motivation was you can always offer rebates, but rebates only to the condition that yes, if you, if you purchase 80% of our product, we give you this much of rebate or maybe if you pr produce this much, we give you this much rebate. But your rebate should not be linked with a fact that you, pr you purchase the complete set of products from us only, then only we will be giving you this rebate or you are binding that particular or foreclosing that particular purchaser from the overall market that creates a competitive problem, which was the case in Intel case. Similar to that kind of a case, we had Kapoor Glass case in which the Competition Commission of India referred to the practices of EU condemning the dis discount policy of a dominant enterprise, which has exclusionary and exploitative benefits. And if you see, it, they referred to Hoffman La Roche case also of EU, and it was held that discount policy of the Kapoor uh, of your uh, Scotch Kaisha was both unfair and discriminatory and was violative of section 42A1 and 42A2 of the act. And this was, they were discriminating between their own downstream player, uh, upstream player, as well as, uh, and the other upstream player like Kapoor Glass. So they, it was a case which relate to a borosilicate glass, which is used for producing ampules. And these ampules are used for producing the, you know, syringe uh, ampules. And Kapoor glass produces these ampules, but the raw material that is borosilicate uh, should come up from the uh, Scotch cash. So this Scotch was selling this particular, uh, it was alleged to be sell that this particular uh, glass at a cheaper price to its own subsidiary than Kapoor glass. Uh, however, there were certain other allegations also in this particular case. We need to go through the complete facts of the case to understand, uh, you know, complete situation. But this is how it, uh, we are talking about royalty debates. Uh, in case of margin squeeze, as I said, it is about your uh, upstream and downstream player and discriminating between the upstream and downstream player. So that is how margin squeeze come up. Second class of abuse, which is mentioned in your section 4 of the act is about putting limitations or restrictions. Now this putting limitations and restrictions is by way of the dominant enterprise because it is only the dominant enterprise and it operates independent of the competitive forces. So it has full motivation to do that. And what it can do? It can limit or restrict the production of goods or provision of services, or in fact also restrict the market itself. Or it can restrict the technical or specific development relating to the goods or services to the prejudice of consumers. So if there is a dominant player, let us take an example. If you, if we, we all remember that uh, those were the days when there were no car manufacturers. It was only Hindustan man, uh, Motors and we had only ambassador cars in the market. Or initially it was scooters when it came, Bajaj scooters. So we did not have any option. You examine a situation now when you have n number of cars, you get model every week. So that is possible just because of competition. If there would have been a dominant player and we can imagine a situation that there was a dominant player and there was no motivation to innovate. Now, it is something which goes by normal situation, it's fine. But if deliberately some dominant player restricts innovation or it does not launch new product or it does not go for innovation and you find this particular thing in their policy document or their uh, communication with their in-house uh, people that yes, we are not going to launch this or we are not going to innovate this particular product because there is no competition in the market. So this is anti-competitive. Then. In Kapoor Glass case, for example, CCI found that the practice of Scotch Glass 
to ensure that the converters do not switch over to other suppliers in upstream market, including imports, limits the overall market of the tube glass and is violative of the provisions of Section 42B1 of the Act, which prohibits a dominant enterprise from engaging in any practice which limits or restricts the market. So basically in this particular case, they have examined this particular aspect. Then we have got the third part which talks about denial of market access. This is the third abuse which can be happening for abuse of the, uh, for by a dominant player in the market. And subclause C to the clause 2 of section 4 talks about this and it says it would be an abuse of dominant position if an enterprise or group indulges in practice or practices resulting in denial of market access in any manner. So it can be any manner. In a recent case which the commission has got in this particular aspect was is in relation to JCB and there was an allegation by Bullsmart which were producing backhoe loaders and uh, JCB was imposing, uh, you know, JCB has restricted this particular uh, Bullsmart from producing backhoe loaders by launching litigation in relation to that particular product saying that this is a design violation. And in fact, they were not able to launch this particular product in this market. If you see prima facie order of the commission, commission observed that JCB by abusing their dominant position in the relevant market sought to stifle competition in the relevant market by denying market access and foreclosing entry of Pulsmart in contravention of the provisions of section 4 of the act. This is the prima facie view of the commission, matter is under investigation. And you see what has happened in this particular case is there is a concept of bad faith litigation which is emerging up. And now this bad faith lit litigation or sham litigation though is in relation to intellectual property. What happens is the parties or you may say the dominant enterprise tries to obstruct the uh, non-dominant enterprise to enter into market by merely saying that there is a uh, intellectual property violation of this. And since the matter is in litigation they get an injunction over that and the entry into the market or you may cheaper product into the market keeps restricted. So this is an aspect which is of very great concern and that is where you talk about denial of market access. When you talk about denial of market access, the concept of essential facilities also emerges. Now this concept of essential facilities is a concept which emerged in United Railroad case in United States. However, later on if you see the concept has been elaborated more by the uh, European Commission in its subsequent decisions and it has taken a uh, you know back seat in US because now they more they are no more interested in that essential market essential facilities doctrine as such. But this essential facility doctrine basically says that it is a kind of a facility which cannot be replicated by the competitor and its access would be required for people or for persons to do it. Uh, this particular aspect was considered by uh, commission in one of the cases that is Arsia Rail in which the question was re in relation to the you know container transport and the case, uh, case was made by the container transport and it was said that railway was abusing its dominant position in this market because it was not granting access to the essential facility that is your railway line or maybe the platform for the private players or private container uh, transport and it was giving preference to the concord. However, the commission held otherwise in this case but definitely this is a very important case to examine as far as essential facility doctrine is concerned. But this essential facility doctrine needs to be further uh, elaborated upon or dealt upon. In fact, uh, I would refer to the latest car spare parts case of the commission in which the commission has though not expressly mentioned this fact of essential facility doctrine but if you see the spare parts has been considered as an essential facility though not expressly mentioning it which is required for the independent manufacturers because if, unless you have that spare parts you cannot independently repair the cars of other manufacturers. So this is, uh, is the concept. And more importantly if you see the national competition policy of 2011, the draft national competition policy that also specifically talks about access to essential facility and that is one of the key objectives of that, that national competition policy. So these are the very important aspects as far as denial of market access is concerned. Though a uh, dominant enterprise in its pure volition or pure business principle it is free to deny market access to anybody. But that ma denial of market access should not be uh, with an objective to you know uh, with an unfair objective in fact to create a anti-competitive situation in the market or to distort the market.
The third one talks about tying and bundling and section 4.2d speaks about this and by virtue of this particular provision, the dominance when an enterprise or a group makes conclusion of contract subject to acceptance of other parties of supplementary obligations which by their nature or according to the commercial usage have no connection with the subject or other contracts would be considered an abuse. So basically what happens in this case is, it is kind of a leveraging only but not specifically leveraging. So here what happens is, you know, the uh, tying in is required and there is a famous case under MRTP if you see, wherein there was a restrictive trade practices when one of the famous examples can be of a gas distributor. You go to a gas distributor, he would say that to get the gas connection, you have to take the gas stove compulsorily. So this was a kind of a famous example which was as a restrictive trade practices it was treated. But later on, this restrictive trade practices, uh, this restrictive trade practices has been removed under the MRTP Act because in our law now we have abuse of dominant position. So if a dominant player forces the other uh, or the market players or consumers to purchase one product in supplemental obligation to other products when they have no correlation altogether, then definitely that is uh, of a consideration. Let us take one more example in this. Like a dominant player produces uh, maybe uh, what you can say, uh, a hair oil, right? Now this hair oil, he is a dominant player in that. Now he is a dominant player in the hair oil market and no, uh, there are no other producers of hair oil. So if a consumer has to purchase the hair oil, he has to go to that particular producer. Now what happens is this producer says that if you have to purchase this hair oil, you have to compulsorily take a comb, you know. Now this comb has no relationship with the hair oil because uh, now somebody can provide a justification like this particular hair oil will be best used when you use this particular comb but you have to provide a scientific justification for that. Now that is that is something which can be provided or in relation to some other product that if it enhances the efficiency of the complementary product but that is a different case altogether. But in this case if it is the situation what is what is happening is in the comm market there are several players. So consumer has a choice of the products as well as of the prices but in case of uh, the hair oil it has no choice because there is only one producer. So it, it is trying to use this particular position into the another market and that is where it leads to our leveraging kind of a thing. Now what happens is there is a concept of full line forcing. So full line forcing is something wherein if you want to buy one product of a producer, it says that you have to buy the n range of products of that particular producer. For example, you want to, you want to purchase a camera from uh, Kodak. Now this Kodak says that when you purchase the camera from Kodak, you have to purchase its lens, you have to purchase its all kind of thing and from here, uh, you have to purchase the battery also from Kodak. Now this is not right because you can purchase battery from some somewhere else, you can purchase lens from somewhere else, you can purchase the flash from somewhere else. Now it is on you, you can purchase the cover from somewhere else. If they are tying in, unless it is functionally justified that yes, the Kodak lens will not work unless it is uh, accompanied with some something else, right? So this is a very important aspect which needs to be considered here. What is important in this particular case is that there must be functional relationship between the tied and bundled products to justify that tying and bundling. If it is not so, then it will be an abuse of dominant position. So this needs to be considered. Now let us come to the last uh, clause of this particular uh, section which is 4.2e and this talks about leveraging. This particular concept of leveraging comes up from US and it says that the dominant enterprise is trying to leverage its position in one market to another market. Now it says when a dominant enterprise or group uses its dominant position in one relevant market to enter into or protect other relevant market, then it is an abuse. Now friends, here if you see, this is a clause which does not feature in your European law. If you see the section 4 of the act, it is in fact, uh, you, you know, we have taken the definition or you have, we have taken these abuses as categorized in article 102 of the European Union law. And in European Union law, this clause does not feature. However, if you see in European Union law, this uh, clause has been interpreted in the case of a famous case called Tetra Pak case. Uh, the point uh, of leveraging was considered by 
the commission in MS, MCX NSE case and this MCX NSE case the, uh, we have dealt with the facts earlier. The CCI found that NSE had used its position of strength in the non-CD segment to protect its position of in the CD segment to be in contravention of section 42E of the act and that is how the, uh, the provision has been taken into consideration. Now let me come down to the, these are the abuses. Now as far as remedies are concerned section 27 of the act provides for remedies and section 27 gives three basic remedies uh, among others that is one it can order cease and desist, second it can impose a penalty up to the tune of 10 percent of the average turnover of the last preceding three years and it can give any other order that is your section 27. But in relation to abuse of dominant position uh, offences, there, there is a specific section, section 28 which provides for an additional remedies and these remedies are that there can be an order to transfer or vesting of property rights, liabilities and obligation. There can be the adjustment of contracts either by discharge or reduction of any liability or obligation or otherwise. There can be the creation, allotment, surrender or cancellation of shares and stocks and securities. This subclause D has been deleted in 2007. The formation which talks, which in fact talked about I believe compensation which has been shifted to the compact that is section 53N. The formation or winding up of an enterprise or the amendment of the memorandum of association or articles of association or other instruments regulating the business of any enterprise. So basically it is, we are talking about change in the structure itself because behavior cannot be regulated. So here in remedies we should understand that we, there, there are two kinds of remedies. One is structural remedies and the other one is behavioral remedies. So structural remedies talks about the change of the structure of the enterprise. So if there is a dominant enterprise, we try to break it, make it two, then it, it is no more dominant because uh, then they will be operating independently. Then the extent to which the circumstances in which provisions of the order affecting an enterprise may be altered by the enterprise and the registration thereof and any other manner matter which may be necessary to give effect to division of the enterprise. So this is what are the remedies provided under the uh, section 28 of the competition act in relation to abuse of dominant position and we have seen there are five kinds of abuses which can happen by a dominant enterprise and for this we need to prove it. There is one grey area in this which needs to be considered and this grey area is in relation to whether the dominant uh, abuse of dominance is a per se offence or a rule of reason offence. So this debate I believe you people have already undergone under the section 3 provision that is when we saw anti-competitive agreements. But in this relation if you see the provision of the section 4 of the act, it says that there is, there is a per se kind of a violation because it does not say that it has to be proved appreciable adverse effect of competition. But uh, generally if you see uh, one has to go for a rule of reason in this particular situation. So that is how uh, the uh, sections are arranged and section 4 abuse of dominance talks about. The next module we will be talking on uh, abuse of dominant position in US and EU and we will have a kind of a comparative uh, thing in module 19. Thank you.